religious. Atopa, very interesting, Sanskrit word, means to create. It basically what it is, I won't read it out here, but in states of crisis or a state of panic among a peasant society, a, a thought form in terms of a wild animal or a creature can be actually created by the neuroses of the, uh, of the community. They will start, like for instance, there was a thing in the 1970s of white fans traveling around the United States abducting children. The, the model of white fan, it kind of became an urban legend and these white fans were being seen and photographed all over the place, yet they didn't actually exist. They were just, uh, they were just part of this kind of tulpa experience. It also happens when strangers are traveling through uh, you know, mysterious countryside. They will actually, they're so frightened by the, uh, the strangeness of the place that they actually imagine they see things, strange animals or strange voices. And the, the tulpa is one that a, a Buddhist monk could actually create. They could sit down and they could say they wanted to create a monster or something. If they kept meditated for months and months and months and months, well, it, it could actually happen technically. And it's very similar to the idea of the, what Jung was saying. Signs in the sky. I mean, I don't know how many, how many UFO books have this picture in it, these orbs in the sky, or every, these documentaries on the Discovery Channel, and they're UFOs, they're alien spacecraft. Well, I looked into this graphic and it was taken, it's actually done in Switzerland, at a time when there was tremendous crisis in Europe. There was a fear of an Islamic invasion, the Ottomans in the southeast, the, the Moors coming in from the south and the Huns coming across the, uh, the Danube. So this would have been, they would have been right in the central Europe. They would have been freaking out at the idea of like, their, their whole society collapsing under this sort of Islamic invasion. And again, then we get lights in the sky. And this is a constant motif all through history. We get lights in the sky, lights in the sky, all whenever there's a crisis or anything like this. And this was a way of parents, true, true the fairy story. And they weren't all bad. Many of them would teach very important lessons about the development of the psyche and the psychology. Rapunzel is a very good one. I read that out in Hebden Bridge the other night. In, I, read, I read it out in a psychological sense. And it's very powerful stuff, this. And our ancestors always had these compensatory mechanisms to help guide society. See, after the European, the last of the shamans, in, the last of the shamans in Europe were the Benedatti of Italy, of northern Italy, that were basically taken out, not killed, but they were reformed into, back into being Catholics in about the 1700s, after they were, um, Carlo Ginzburg's book, The Night Battles, well worth reading, the interviews between the Inquisition and the, uh, these Bernadette. They were the last European shamans. Like all shamans, what a shaman really does, they go into the dark world, into the meditative states, into the other side. They battle the demons there, so the demons or whatever they are, the forces do not manifest within reality. So the idea was they believed that if they went on these shamanic trips in northern Italy around Verona in the 16 and 1700s, if they fought what they called witches there, they wouldn't have crime in the real world. And apparently, according to the Inquisition's records, they didn't have crime until they stopped, they prevented them from doing these, uh, these uh, shamanic rituals. And that's, a, that's the real purpose of sham shamanism all over the world. We lost that in 1860, when the last of the Druids were murdered over here in Anglesey. But we still had to compensate for these things, so we created European fairy tales. And chil children do not generally experience paranormal events until they are on the cusp of puberty. You'll find that nearly all these poltergeist experiences where the things are flying around the house, it's nearly always a teenage girl going through a very bad puberty with lots of menstrual pains and no father at home. It's nearly always that, that, that way. So it's a, a young girl on the cusp of a very difficult puberty inside an emotionally and psychologically troubled family, and usually a poor family. And what happens is we don't, children don't resolve their, their psychic inner turmoil anymore. And this is, a, I'm going to leave the next slide, but they're, we're giving them psychotropic drugs, Ritalin and so on. This is not allowing their psyche to develop. What's happening then is rather than actually confront the shadow, confront the darkness of the world, they're actually working their way through nothing. They're getting a medication. Now, I know some kids may have some serious problems and need these things, but in the United States, they're handing them out like Smarties. And that's a real problem because you're going to have a whole generation growing up with literally a fractured, unresolved psyche. And this brings us to the latest and strangest paranormal thing 
event that I've heard of, and this has been happening for about three years now, black-eyed children. These are kids in groups of them, usually around between 10 and 13 of age. The reports are all nearly always the same. There's a knock on the door, someone opens the door, and when they go in, when they open the door, they have this group of these children, and their eyes are jet black. There's no pupils, there's no whites, it's just blackness in their eyes. And this, they, they, always, they demand to be let into the house, and the parents, or the people that open the door, always say no. Interestingly, they seem to appear a lot to traveling businessmen in hotels. In a hotel room on the 15th floor, there's a knock, and the guy opens, and these children with the black eyes are there wanting to come in the hotel room. I'm starting to speculate now, is this like a tulpa of a sort of a suppressed guilt by, by the culture that we're medicating our children far too much? Maybe not even just uh, psychotropic drugs, perhaps vaccines. This could be, you see, when we're doing something that's wrong against natural law, against the psyche, it, whether it's personal or collective, it explodes and blows up in your face in terms of psychic trauma. And my, I'm speculating now, I could be completely wrong, that these black-eyed children are a collective psychic trauma caused by the inability to deal with proper parenting among various classes within American society, particularly the professional classes who would rather have Ridlin, now I'm not putting them all down, but it's Ridlin take care of their children than be proper parents themselves and read them fairy tales. And also we have the issue with Disney. Disney have corrupted and perverted most of these fairy tales to sexualize the children at an earlier age. And that's a whole other issue as well. Now, that's the dark side. Let's have a look. Is there a way we, we, can, we can use this stuff? We can actually get this stuff to work for us. You know, understanding it is the first way. Understanding things in this, in this, this manner is a very good process because, one, you're not locked into dogma, and two, you're resolving the issue to your own consciousness rather than having someone tell you what this really means. Very important. This is why I'm not a big fan of psychiatry. So what can we do to get at this? So we had stress-related dynamic consciousness. Is it possible to have intention-related dynamic consciousness? I actually think there is. I really do believe there is. Uh, create the, John Carew Eccles, the greatest, greatest neuroscientist that ever lived, said that creative imagination is the most profound of human activities. Absolutely it is. I, if anyone's seen my video, my talk in ARC, back in How to Paint Yourself Out of a Corner, uh, just show that basically creativity does more than just allows you to be creative. You're actually creating the processes that might actually change your life going forward. It doesn't matter what it is, painting, arting, making clothes, whatever, music. Once you're creating, you have the ability to create a better understanding of yourself. And from that, a literal transfer of your intention towards a, a reconfiguration or a re-engineering of your future consciousness experience within this reality. Very important stuff. And that's why we have to be careful about what kinds of movies we watch, what kinds of concepts we buy into, how we process religious experiences, how we process anything, symbolism. We have to be very careful because a lot of this stuff is neutral. It's not negative, it's not positive, but if you put a negative swing on it, boy, you'll get negative results. If you put a positive swing on it, you, you might, and I can't, I can't prove it, because it seems, it seems, this is the great irony and the great paradox of this problem. When people are psychologically destroyed or emotionally ruined, they seem to have no problem changing reality in a very negative way. But it seems very, very difficult to do it the other way around, to change it in a positive way. It does happen, but it takes much more work and over a very, very long time, basically because the, the fabric of reality at the quantum level is so, the, the, the particles are so densely packed that it takes an extreme mo emotional or psychic trauma to actually explode them apart and we have these experiences. Now this is one of the most important quotes ever made in history and uh, reductionist scientists go to enormous uh, lengths to hide this, well hide it but make sure you don't know too much about it. And he said after decades of opening up brains and looking inside them, it would appear that it, the human brain, is a sort of machine a ghost could operate. Very interesting use of language. 
If by ghost we mean, in the first place, an agent, also a very interesting use of language, the word agent, whose action has escaped detection even by the most de delicate physical instruments, we're not in our brains. We're just not in there. It's just a machine that processes consciousness. Now, a neuroscientist will say, ah, sure, I can see, this, this, I can see the, the, the electrical signal firing across the synapse. Yes, but the, the actual, if it's, the, say it's retrieving a memory, that memory wasn't in the brain. It came from somewhere else and was processed through the synapses in the cerebral partitions at that moment. But it doesn't mean it came from there. It's just like saying you open up your TV and you, you want to find the Kardashians in there. They're not in there. It's the same process. So which ghost or agent would you prefer in your brain? Be careful what you let in. He used the word ghost and agent. He didn't use anything else, and he used that for a reason. This is actually one of his graphics. And he, it's so complex, but he basically came up with this schematic here. The white one is his. The rest is mine. Basically, this is how the neural network operates. It's, a, it's an array, an antenna array. You ever see those antenna arrays where they're like a, across a field or something? Uh, they're used, used in military communications a lot. And they're not only, it, you know, you have a break in this, 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 this pathway here. It can compensate by going down another one. It's an extremely complex matrix, the neural network. It can compensate, rebuild itself. Neuroplasticity and epigenetics, you can actually change your brain to the brain that your thoughts are creating. So we have reality. You looking at me, me looking at you, here. The neural network is both the broadcaster and the receiver. It's a two-way system. Insert the ghost here. That's your consciousness, that's your personality, but it could be something else. I think, you know, you hear these cases of schizophrenia. You may have two literal, I'm not saying I'm an expert in schizophrenia, this is just a theory, two personalities in here. Someone who's been mind-controlled, the, the created personality in here. So this is where the ghost is. Between the neural network and the perception of reality, in here is where divisions happen. In here, when something goes wrong, is when the demons of the mind happen. You're not inside your skull. You're working your way through it. This is why you have to be very careful of what you let into your head and how you think. Oh, we're running out of time here. If you're not building your brain structure, who's going to build it for you? Whatever, every thought has a neurological cause and effect. It's actually been shown that it will change RNA and protein sequences in the brain. Your brain will build neural pathways according to the thoughts you have. So if you literally have stinking thinking, you'll have a stinking brain. If you have a positive brain, without being infantile about it, you'll have a brain geared towards that every time we learn a new skill, we develop a new neural pathway. It's amazing. We had, we, so many of us, like my, one of the great things about me studying psychopaths is that I've come to almost see the human brain as like the greatest thing in the, in the cosmos. It may even be the creating, the creating this universe. But it's so incredibly powerful, yet we're just told it's just a, a massive gray cells, and it's nothing of the sort. Between that and the five senses and the nervous system, this is probably the greatest, not me, but all of us, the most amazing, and we're all wired in together, the collective, remember, the greatest, uh, the greatest thing in the universe that we're aware of at the moment. But the consciousness can be fooled, and it can be tricked, and it can be manipulated by everything from mass media to political spin. We all know that, using repetitive phrases. A phrase used over and over again enters your consciousness. And what happens then is that becomes your reality. You say it enough times, it will become reality. You heard Alex earlier on about the Alternative 3 film. The people saw it on TV. Even though if you watch that thing now, the acting is actually hammy. It's really bad acting. But it actually entered into people's consciousness. They thought it was real. They were tricked. Sleight of hand really should mean sleight of mind. So that will generate the neural network, but not in your favor. And the, the psychopathic control grid, as I call it, that's the term I use uh, to describe the control system, which would be banking, extreme ends of banking, extremes, political uh, 
cooperation with these banking and things like the military industrial complex. Reward circuits in the brain are tuned into comforting familiar opinions. This is why when you walk up to people and you tell them this new knowledge you get, they, they have a, a sudden shock. What's happened is neopinephrine has rised up from the lower brain stem and they go into a fight or flight mode. And they go, what? And you just say something like, you know, I don't think vaccines work. I just think it's a big scam to get money every year for the flu. And they go, and they go what? And that happens. What's happened then is that the neuro, neopinephrine is shot up from the lower brain stem and they're in flight or flight mode. Flight or fight mode. And then they'll say something like, are oh, you mad? Or oh, you're on a cult? Or oh, you're an idiot? And what happens then is the reward circuit releases dopamine into the prefrontal cortex. It's the same thing you get when you fall in love or when you, you have sex. They're chilled again. And that's what happens. That's why when you're trying to wake people up, you have to do it slowly. People are terrified of opinions that are new to them. They absolutely are. People are, especially people that are in dogmas or in and religious organizations or part into political systems, they're terrified of hearing it. There's a cognitive dissonance like you wouldn't believe. And we all know that cognitive dissonance is not driven by that they're being told a lie. The cognitive dissonance is being driven by the fact that they're being told the truth, but they don't want to accept it. And there's disruptions in brain chemistry, which alters, which is altered when someone confronts a new idea, which makes them hostile, neopinephrine. And when they return to the belief package, the reward circuits in the brain makes them feel happy. Dopamine, very simple, chemicals. In extreme conditions and heightened emotional intensity, the very fabric of reality can be altered. And can the demons of the mind, or tulpas, then manifest? Okay, a quick one about like building a firewall around your consciousness. I've got more about this in my two books outside, De Defeated Demons and uh, Reject and Survive. This, this bloody thing here gets so much hype. It's just a pyramid with nine. That's all it is. They, they, they want us to go, fear, 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 ignore. Uh, that's a picture of a sausage roll, something like that. <laughs> so that, that, that brings in individuality, creativity, building your own neural network and your own neural plasticity through ha saying, I don't care about this. Engaging with your shadow and mastering it. I, new age stuff is not very good in a lot of ways because they don't want to confront darkness. They don't want to confront negativity. You have to go and, and confront that stuff because if you don't confront it, you'll never ever be able to transcend it. And also the truth is often found in your revulsion to the bad aspects of yourself. So take back the symbols and use them for yourself. Ignore hype and sensationalism. Oh, that's, a, that's a really big one because that's hype and sensation, sensationalism about everything is purely created to alter your brain chemistry by giving you rushes and changes in chemistry and chemicals. And it's the, it's, the, it's the elation and the disappointment is what keeps you addicted because you literally become addicted to the reward circuits and you want a fix of that dopamine. Independence of body, mind and soul. You're, you're, you're a sovereign mind, you don't have to join systems, you don't have to believe what anyone tells you. In fact, it's, it's, a, it's a corruption of your own humanity if you do, as far as I'm concerned. You're here to be, to experience this unique experience on your own, on your terms. Cynicism and healthy, healthy skepticism. I'm actually quite a skeptical person. I, I'm very close to being an agnostic, except I've had experiences in my life that, that changed that for me. But the problem with skeptics today, they don't have healthy skepticism. They're really pseudo-skeptics. They, they're, they're really about enforcing and protecting the status quo. Ivan Illich wrote a book called The Schooling Society, where he explains that the purpose of education, more, you know, more specifically, as you go through the university system, is just about making you believe that everything is fine just the way it is. And that's what skepticism today is all about. Everything is fine just the way it is. And just understand how amazing your mind is. It's not just a bunch of gray cells and a bit of fat and water in your head. It, could, it may well be the actual machine that's driving the entire cosmos. As incredible as that sounds, but like quantum physics shows us that, that you know, that's the most wildly te wa wa uh, widely tested scientific theorem of any. And the results always come back that your mind can actually alter the fabric of reality. Now, we can only do it on a very light and small and limited level. But as has been shown through the demons of the mind, when we have a really bad experience, wow, some of the things that can happen is incredible. Let's try and see if there's a way now. And perhaps the next stage of evolution is a finding a way that we can do that for ourselves without the trauma. 
And so, to finish with it, you are the ultimate creator of your own reality. No limits. I don't mean you can jump out of a building and fly, but no limits in terms of how you can utilize your cognitive abilities to actually process your understanding of the world. No fear. When I, when I say fear, I really mean anxiety. Anxiety and a fear is a different thing. You need fear if you're running across the street and a guy comes around the corner really fast. You, have that, you need that fear to get out of his way. It's really anxiety. Lose the anxiety because that's a terrible barrier to enhancing your neural network, it's been shown. It can also very badly damage your physical health as well. So lose the anxiety. Use, lose the used to the, the fears, you know, like try to process them. I used to tarot for that. Tarot cards are fantastic for, uh, for working your way through that stuff. And no problem, I don't mean like everything's no problem, but like always believe that a problem can be fixed. And when a politician comes on TV and he says, we're going to put in an extra thousand taxes, yeah, it's a pain in the ass, yeah, it's annoying, but you as a person will transcend this. So there's no need to get bogged down in that. And uh, so that's basically it. I hope you enjoyed that. And that's just my two cents on a piece of the puzzle. I could be wrong. And if you have any of your theories on it, I'd love to hear them because I'm here to learn as well. So thanks very much.